I was talking to one of our young people just the other day, and they were saying, Pastor, we haven't heard of your friends Harold and Myrtle Llewellyn lately. <laughs> and I said, well, funny thing, I was just over visiting them just the other day. And while I was there, I was visiting with Harold, and Myrtle came in, and she was carrying a bag from the store. And when she came in, she, she had this bag, and, and Harold kind of looked at her and said, what did you get? And she pulled out this dress. And it was a fancy dress, and uh, it, was, it was precisely the color of butternut squash. Uh, now, you know Myrtle, of course. She's won 27 blue ribbons in the category of butternut squash. And so she was holding that up to herself, and she was so excited about this beautiful new dress. And Harold said, uh, Myrtle, uh, we have been saving up money for our anniversary. We're going to go to Gatlinburg this year. And so we are saving up money in order to do this, and yet you bought a dress. And she said, doesn't it look beautiful? Now, what are you as a husband supposed to say to that? But, but, but here's what Harold said. He said, Myrtle, what you need to know is and we've talked about this many times, that when temptation comes in your life, you need to say, get behind me, Satan. Did you do that? And Myrtle said, yes, I did that. And he said, well, what happened then? Well, Satan said, well, the dress looks good from behind too. <laughs> Our theme for today is temptation. You heard it in our lesson for today. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I love this line from John Dryden, an old English poet and playwright, who said, better to shun the bait than struggle in the snare. Anybody ever been in that snare before? Is it painful? Potentially deadly? We have been there, haven't we? We all have been there. And so, better to shun the bait. Uh, I heard a story this week about a dog named Arrow. Arrow was in the newspaper in part for being given an Egg McMuffin. <laughs> now, why was Arrow in the news this week? He was in the news because Arrow is a police dog. And single-handedly, he rounded up four suspects who had just committed a crime. They spread in different directions. Arrow snagged all four of the suspects. And his reward was, of course, an Egg McMuffin. So that's major for a dog. But I want you to notice something. Arrow is sitting there with this smell right below his nose. And is he eating? You see, a dog training principle is this. If the dog is looking at the food and you don't want him to eat it, you're in trouble. <laughs> if the dog is looking at his master, he's going to forget about the food. So that's a common dog training trick. It's look at me, look at me, because when the dog is focusing on who? the master, he's going to stay safe. When he's thinking about what he wants to think on, he is in trouble. All right? Temptation. When we focus on who? The master, we stay safe. Whenever we focus on what we want, what the flesh wants, 
we are in trouble. Today, we are going to be turning to Matthew chapter 4. And I want to tell you in the beginning that Matthew is systematically introducing Jesus to his readers. In chapter 1, he introduces the Savior. Remember when the angel came to Joseph? And the angel came to Joseph and he said to him, You are to name the child Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So chapter 1, we're presented with the Savior. Chapter 2 we are presented with the king. Remember, the kings from the east showed up saying, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? And as the book goes on, we will find he's not just king of the Jews, he's king of the nations. But this was, we said last week, the key theme throughout this book. He is king and the kingdom of heaven and kingdom character and kingdom principles, all of those things. At the end of chapter 3, the last words before we turn to today, we heard that Jesus is the Son of God. He was baptized in Matthew chapter 3. When he came up out of the water, the heavens were parted, the Spirit descended, and the voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved. With him I'm well pleased. And so we've met God's Son. Today we are reminded in part that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. He is the king that uh, the Israel has been waiting for. And as we turn to Matthew 4, whoa, things are just speeding by here. Yeah, we may just go really fast through this. <laughs> but the key word is that the time was fulfilled and the prophecy was fulfilled and who is Jesus in the midst of this uh, he is the long awaited Messiah all of these prophecies point to him now as we read this and I was going to read it first, but I don't think I can get back to that slide. But it essentially says, uh, Now when Jesus heard that John had been with, arrested, he withdrew to Galilee, and there's a prophecy that was fulfilled, and at the end he began proclaiming. But here's what you need to know. This passage right here focuses on, well, first of all, have you heard me say, Wrong time, wrong place equals wrong results, right? We've been there, haven't we? Wrong time, wrong place, wrong results. What, what happens in this story is right time, right place, right results. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been with, uh, arrested, he withdrew to Galilee, all right? This was the right time. All right, John, if you remember, was the final, John the Baptist was the final Old Testament prophet. He was the final prophet to speak before the Messiah began his ministry. So John is the final Old Testament prophet. And when he was arrested, the time for Jesus' ministry began. Everything was fulfilled in the right time. So there's right time. Secondly, we have the right place. It says, Jesus then went and made his home in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. They were two of the 12 tribes. They were territories. And so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And he goes on and talk about the prophet Isaiah, talks about the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the road of the sea, Galilee of the Gentiles. Here's what you need to know about Galilee. The historian Josephus, Josephus uh, lived uh, a generation or two after Jesus. He was a Roman. He was the governor of the area that would include Galilee. And he was writing much historically of what we know that corroborates what's in the New Testament. And he was governor including the land of, of Galilee. 
Galilee at the time was hugely populated. If you've been there now, there's not many people around Galilee, but back in those days, there were three million people surrounding Essentially, it was a lake. That's what Luke always called it. Luke had been more places in the world than all the rest, and he said, that's not a sea, that's a lake. And there were 3 million people around here, maybe 280 towns. And we'll see this next week that Jesus ministered. He spent the first years of his ministry ministering to all of these towns. And so Jesus is here. It's interesting, it's called Galilee of the Gentiles. It wasn't filled with Gentiles, but it was mixed. There were Jews there, there were Gentiles there. It was kind of the intersection point where Israel begin to relate to the rest of the world. So it's the right time. It's the right place. This is where God in prophecy had said, I am going to place you at the beginning of your ministry. And we have the right result. The result, the beginning of his preaching is this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You've made a mess of your lives. Israel, you've made a mess of your country. Individually, yes, you have made a mess of your lives. But guess what? God has opened heaven. Not only has the Holy Spirit begun to descend, but the Messiah is standing in your midst. And now is the time. But in order to receive this gift, you need to repent. You need to turn away from your sin and you need to turn to God. That is the right result for our lives, for the kingdom to receive this gift. So, we have this sense of the kingdom has come near. The king has come. Are you ready to receive it? Repent. And so we turn to the first part of Matthew chapter 4. This year we're not, we're not doing a chapter a week. We're doing probably about a half chapter a week. So we want to turn to the beginning of Matthew chapter 4. And I'd love as you go through for you to start bringing your own Bible so you can underline things that are making a difference to you. Uh, but we have the scripture here. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights and afterwards was finished. I was always confused. Why did the Holy Spirit, and, and this is the way Mark records it, he says, the Spirit drove him immediately after his baptism into the wilderness, drove him there. Why? It says, to be tempted by the devil. Now, how many of you are going to take your kids and go, all right, time for you to be tempted? <laughs> We're not going to do that, are we? And yet, that's the first thing that happens. And so, I was wondering, was this test for Jesus? Was this test for Satan? Who was this test for? When we experience some form of temptation, from God's perspective, it's a test. From, our, from Satan's perspective, it's a temptation, right? So Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And I think, after researching it more clearly this week, that it was so Satan would know truly who Jesus was. Jesus knew who he was, but Satan needed to confront him and find out what was really happening. But anyway, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, about as long as we can possibly fast and still have some strength, that much strength. And afterwards, he was famished. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God. Now, I want you to think about this sense. First of all, afterwards he was famished. That human weakness that is in us. Uh, one of my 
favorite scriptures, and it was actually our, our confession this morning. It says, once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins, you used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He, Satan, is the power at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live according to the passions of our flesh, following the desires of our evil nature. But God, and there's always the good news, but God is so rich in mercy and he loves us so very much that even while we were doomed because of our sins, God saved us by his grace. Okay, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are our enemies in life, okay? The world lies to us. Turn on our TVs. I'm, I'm, I'm increasingly, I sound like an old guy now, but I'm increasingly more concerned with what happens not only when we turn on our TVs, but it's when our kids turn on our TVs, right? The world is selling sin. Do you know what else is selling sin? Our own desires. The heart wants. This is Woody Allen's defense for marrying his adopted daughter. <laughs> the heart wants what the heart wants. Right? Our flesh drives us into sin. And then Satan is there all the time going, do it, try it, it's not that bad. Of course, then as soon as you do it, he says, oh, <laughs> nobody's ever going to love you again. Right? He's the tempter and the accuser. So we see Jesus was in a place of vulnerability. His flesh, right? And then we have Satan that is here. And Satan is all of these things. He is destruction. He's the accuser. He's the adversary. He's the angel of the bottomless pit. He is antichrist. He is Apollyon the destroyer. He's a beast, Beelzebub, Belial. He is the deceiver, the devil, the dragon. He's the enemy, the evil one. He's the god of this age, the lawless one, Leviathan, liar, and the father of lies. On and on it goes. Throughout Scripture, he is the one that is behind us, whispering lies, making us vulnerable in our lives. And so the tempter came to Jesus and said to him, <laughs> and I like this part, if you are the Son of God, and that temptation, prove it, Jesus. Satan knew who he was. It's not intellectual faith that matters, it's our heart. But if you are, and that insecurity, no one's going to believe you unless you start showing who you are. So, so, so if you are, because maybe I really don't believe it, but if you are the Son of God, command these stones to be loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so temptation number one, is will God provide? You ever wonder, Dan? Or are you going to have to do it yourself? It's that temptation to take that under our control. I'll come back to this one because this one's important. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, that temptation again, <laughs> if you're really the Son of God, I don't, know if, I don't know if I can think of you as the Son of God. But if you are, throw yourselves down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. David read both of those passages today. Notice what Satan's doing. He's actually using the Word of God. Isn't that what he did in the garden? He said to Eve, didn't God say, and then he misquoted God. And Eve said, no, God said, and then she misquoted God. That was actually the first human sin. It wasn't eating the apple, it was misquoting the word of God. But yet, Jesus understood the word of God. 
And not only did he understand what Satan was trying to do, he interpreted this correctly. And he put a more important principle in there. Do not put the Lord of your God to the test. And the second temptation is this, will God really protect you? If you fall, and Jesus says, I'm not putting the Lord to the test. I'm not going to try and back God into a corner. How many of us have ever done something really bad, really stupid, and then turned to God and said, you got to get me out of this? Right? We're putting him to the test. Well, I'm going to do this. And if it's not right, I'm going to just trust God to make it right. Okay? We do that. We put him to the test. Now, Jesus was being tempted here that you can have all of your fame immediately. Think about what the crowds would say if you just dived off and all of a sudden angels showed up and caught you and just put you gently on the ground. Everybody would cheer you. God's going to do it. He's already promised put him to the test. You can become famous sooner. Jesus says, I'm not going to do that. Third temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will just fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left and suddenly angels came and waited upon him. The third one, will you compromise? God has already promised, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of this world. In fact, I think Jesus owned them before he came down to earth, right? Before he humbled himself and took the form of a slave, as it says in Philippians 2. He already owned them. But Satan tried to tempt that human weakness to say, I can give them to you faster if you'll just worship me. How many of us have ever compromised to get what we think is already promised, to think what, get what we deserve? How many of us have ever? And that's the question we, this, we keep coming back to you. I want to talk about this one for just a minute. Will God provide or must you provide for yourself? I mean, there's a lie that rattles through our head. Is God going to provide? Am I going to have to take matters in my own hand? Am I going to have to do it for myself? I mean, after all, God wants me to eat. I've been fasting for 40 days. God wants you to eat. Just You have the power to do it. You have the ability to take things into your hands and provide and to do things without waiting on God. Are you, are you going to do it? That's the question that he has given. Are you going to do it? Will God or must you? Now, I've been thinking about these passages all week. And I have seen again and again in the lives of our members how these play out. And how Satan is involved. And twisting things. Uh, and what you need to know is what percentage of us can be at the right time if we're hit in the right place? What percentage of us can be vulnerable to the lies of Satan? 100%. Okay? So I have seen people of equal faith in hard situations. Something hard happens, and what it does is it surfaces every insecurity in our lives going back a long ways. Faithful people. And it's reminding people of the truth. I've seen others that are in horrible circumstances and they turn around and say, I don't know how people do this without faith. We are vulnerable in this life. And it's when we are not paying attention. It's when we become too hungry, too angry, too lonely, too tired. In one of my devotions this week, I said, I'm most vulnerable when I'm tired. And busyness is my greatest enemy. And when I'm tired, the shields aren't up like they are sometimes. And I'm vulnerable. 
will God really provide for me? Or do I have to do it for myself? Do I have to chase my own version of happiness? Do I have to? Or do I trust that God is going to provide? You know, one of the biggest lies that happens is something happened somewhere in our lives that was really bad. And we ask the question, where was God? I mean, if God is really a provider, where was he when that bad thing happened? Where was he? I like to tell the story of uh, most of us like gravity most of the time, don't we? <laughs> okay? If it wasn't for gravity, imagine us all floating in space. The first time we ever have a disagreement with somebody we care about, we push them away. Well, in space, what happens when you push someone away? They go on forever. <laughs> They go one way, you go another way. We like gravity. But you know what? The first funeral I ever did was when someone fell off of a ladder and gravity was not their friend. We like free will. We enjoy it every day. We do what we want to do. But when someone else's free will hurts us, then we turn around and we blame God. When I was teaching Pastor Conda's class for a few weeks while he was in South America, I was, te I was telling the group, because we were on this part of the temptation in the garden, I was saying, listen, when we are tempted, what, what the lie is, is we love this free will until it reaches up and bites us. And then what we do is we keep blaming God. If only God had made the world perfect. Whose fault is the world's not perfect? It must be God's. If only God made everything like a perfect family. Well, he did, and then Cain killed Abel. And we would blame it on God. If only God did this. If only God would, you know, the world's so bad, why didn't God just start all over again? Because it must be his fault that it's bad. And we like free will until it comes up and bites us. And we have this question of, does God really provide? How does he provide? Just really quickly, from one of my favorite websites, Got Questions. What does, God, what does it mean that God provides? There are at least 169 verses that refer to the ways that God provides for us. God is concerned with every part of our being, our spirit, our soul, and our body. As the facets of his character are infinite, so the ways God provides for us are beyond anything that we can ask or imagine. The Father knows our needs, but in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to ask for provision. And our dependence on God is affirmed each time we pray. That prayer is our relationship. God, provide. Many passages about God's provision relate to our need for the daily physical needs of life, but most refer to the needs of our soul and our spirit, our inner person. Right? So, let me give you an example. Jesus was led up by the Spirit, was tempted for 40 days. 40 days he fasted. He was hungry. The tempter came and said, turn these things into loaves of bread. He was hungry. 40 days hungry. And at the end of the temptation, does it say that God came and provided food? It says, no, he came and provided comfort. Many of the ways that God provides, because does everybody here know that there's going to be death in this world? There's going to be hurt and pain and sin, but God provides us with peace in the midst of us, hope and comfort and wisdom in order to make it through. There's assurance. God provides us with himself. And God's ultimate provision has already been forgiven given. We've been forgiven and we're given eternal life. Will God provide for you? Yes. He will provide for you. So here very quickly is how to avoid temptation in your life. How to avoid temptation. So the first is thanksgiving. 
Paul the Apostle wrote Philippians. He probably had the hardest Christian life aside from Jesus himself who was crucified on the cross. And Paul says, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Right? Can do all through Christ who strengthens you. But I love what leads up to this. For I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little and I know what it has to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need, and it's in here. I can do all through Christ who strengthens me. Okay? So just very quickly, how to avoid temptation? First of all, take a deep breath. God loves you and he understands. He loves you and he understands how hard this life is. Take a deep breath. Quit beating yourself up over it. Take a deep breath. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet was without sin. How else do we do this? Love God's word. How did Jesus defeat Satan time and again? It is written, it is written, it is written. We need to love his word. We need to love him and thereby love his word. We need to fill our lives with it so when the trials come, we can't be tricked into something that will lead us in the wrong direction. We need to repent because the kingdom has come near. Do you know what happens when we bring the lies and the temptations and the struggles into the light. The light begins to quickly defeat the darkness. But we need to say it out loud, sometimes to someone. We've lost a lot in the Lutheran, having left the Catholic Church of saying, oh, you can just go straight to God for your confession, and you can. But there's a powerful thing that happens when we bring it into the light with someone else. We need to watch and we need to pray. We need to stay alert and pray that you may not come. Jesus was in the garden. He said, stay awake, watch, pray. We need to pray about our temptations. We need to find accountability partners. Someone that can help us stand strong. And we need to focus on the master, not the temptation. We need to look at him, right? Because if we look down, trouble. When we look at the master, we are strong. And we need to love the master. We need to love his word. We need to love his ways. It is written, it is written, it is written. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we confess that we are weak, but we give thanks that you are strong. When we are weak, Lord, strengthen us. Give us hope, give us comfort, give us light. We pray in the name of your Son. Amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.